to Emerging Technology Horizons. Uh, I'm Dr. Mark Lewis. I'm the Executive Director of NDIA's Emerging Technologies Institute. And uh, this is one of our series of podcasts where we talk, talk to thought leaders uh, on the intersection of innovation and emerging technologies. And today it's my incredible pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Meng Chang, who is the Dean of Engineering at Purdue University's College of Engineering. Um, th this discussion comes at, an ama at a great time. Uh, Purdue was just ranked the number four uh, graduate engineering program mm -hmm. uh, in the United States. But really, in my mind, once you're in the top five, there's there's no distinction. So 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 you so so Purdue University is now in in the stratosphere. But of course, um, I, I think it's you know it's always been one one of the world's foremost engineering programs. And and Meng, you've been a phenomenal leader. Um, I, I want to say a few words about about Dean Chang's background. Um, if if I went through all of his honors and awards and accomplishments, it would fill the entire podcast. So so I'll I'll, I'll do the abbreviated version. Uh, uh, Dean Dean Chang uh, uh, came to the, the is the tenth dean of engineering at Purdue. Uh, assumed that position in July of 2017. Previous to that, he was a faculty member at uh, Princeton University. Um, and uh, I, I believe you were one of the youngest endowed chairs at Princeton mm -hmm. University. And then you became one of the youngest deans of engineering in the country. Um, so really quite an accomplishment. Uh, you, you joined Princeton after doing graduate work at Stanford, uh, also attended Queens College in Hong Kong. Uh, you're known for your work in communication networks. You've, you've won awards, including the IEEE Kiyotama Yusu Award 2012, the Alan Waterman Award in 2013, and you were a Guggenheim Fellow. Um, I also want to point out that, that Dean Chang was the sixth uh, Office of Science Technology Advisor to the Secretary of State, a position you held from December of 2019 to December of 2020 on, on, on leave from your, your position at Purdue. So, so really a strong sense of service to the nation, uh, not, not just service to the engineering community and education, but service to the nation as well. So, Mung, thank you so much for joining us today. So, Mark, great to be here. Thank you so much for the kind invitation. So, so Munga, I, I, if it, you know, I was hoping to talk to you about the kind of the issues that are facing uh, facing us as we talk about innovation, talk about emerging technologies, among the the, the role of U.S. academic institutions in, in contributing to national defense. Tell me your thoughts on that. Yeah. So, first of all, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, it's great to be here, and congratulations on the uh, Emerging Technology Institute at NDIA. Such a fantastic institute. Uh, in service of the of the nation, and you know, I think the academia institutions have a significant and unique role to play in the space of national security and defense. Uh, first and foremost, perhaps, is the talent pipeline development, the workforce training, uh, and graduating students from undergrad, masters, PhDs, uh, and uh, provide online learning opportunities to those who are already uh, in the workforce. And that applies to many industry sectors in the economy, but in particular, it does apply to national security and defense as well, uh, the educational dimension. And second, I think there are some fundamental research that are uh, particularly well suited for university labs and uh, engineering colleges in particular. For example, Purdue Engineering, mm -hmm. which is, uh, as you just said, are now ranked and it's a graduate research program as uh, number four in the country. And we're immensely proud of the reflection of our faculty and student success. Uh, and certain research are not uh, the best fit in terms of the nature and time scale and the metrics it wants to achieve uh, for universities. But there are many, especially in fundamental research and to increasing extend translational uh, impact as well. And I'll say thirdly is that uh, a place like Purdue, uh, we have also strong partnerships with uh, the private sectors, mm. including those in the defense industry and with uh, our uh, federal and state government entities. Uh, we have land that are being rented or purchased by companies and governmental entities uh, for their uh, operation here. And by being physically close to each other, uh, we can also uh, introduce a lot of uh, complementary dynamics uh, 
uh, just by the mere fact that uh, they are in our research park and uh, our faculty and students are not too far away. I I have to I have to say I I don't know of a state that does that better. <laughs> Thank in Indiana, you. you've got you've you've got NSWC, the Navy Center at Crane. Mm. Uh, your universities, I know you've got a very close partnership with Notre Dame and Indiana University, yes. and then the, your corporate partners, you know, mm -hmm. entities like old Rolls-Royce, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really impressed by the way you've been able to put that together. I, I don't know of another state mm -hmm. that, is, that, is, that has quite managed that as well as, as well as Indiana. Well, we are proud of that here at the Hoosier State, and uh, the team consists of not only uh, one or multiple universities here in the state, but also uh, IEDC, the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, uh, and includes a lot of our great corporate partners. For example, you, know, you mentioned Rolls-Royce. Uh, indeed, they have their building here, which used to be at the tip of uh, a highway intersection. Uh, uh, it's a beautiful building, and uh, it's a little bit out there. But over the past few years, uh, thanks to the leadership by President Mitch Daniels, of Purdue University and Brian Edelman, who is the president of Re Purdue Research Foundation that uh, operates, uh, among other things, uh, the land around what we now call the Zucker Aerospace District and the Discovery Park District. These two districts, one to the north, one to the south of uh, 231 Highway, uh, they form this whole new innovation campus. And now we've got many other companies. Those already in public domain include like Saab, from Sweden, a great corporate partner uh, that's uh, building their manufacturing site here in this uh, district as well. So Rolls-Royce is no longer by itself. There's an increasing number, in fact, to the point that we are looking at running out of land soon uh, at the rate that it's growing. Uh, so this is what I call creating jobs and knowledge at the same time. Uh, and and that's a good problem to have, by hey, the way, running out of land. That's, that, that you're growing in, indeed. Yeah. Even here in Very Indiana. Good. So the boilermakers are doing their <laughs> research, you know, doing their education, but also forming both research and uh, physical partnership uh, that's very healthy uh, for both national security uh, development and also for the local economy. Very good. Now, I know in addition to, to roles, I, I know you're, you're doing a lot of work in microelectronics. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which, of course, when I was in the Pentagon, that was that was our number one yes. priority, and 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 you've embraced it. Yeah. Well, uh, I think I have some good news to share. Right now, it is Monday. I don't know when the press release will be officially out. Uh, should be today, maybe tomorrow. Uh, but I think it's safe to say, uh, in public at this point, uh, that uh, there is a brand new research center being launched exactly in the area of uh, semiconductors and. Microelectronics. It's called CSME, Center for Secure Microelectronics Ecosystem, at Purdue. And well, guess who are the uh, corporate partners? Uh, uh, TSMC from Taiwan and the Synopsis, uh, the EDA uh, tool maker. Uh, and of course, TSMC is one of the uh, largest, most dominant uh, foundry companies in the world. And therefore, uh, we have tremendous opportunity here. Uh, at Purdue uh, in Indiana to look into the uh, revitalization, if you will, of the entire semiconductors uh, industry here in the United States, along with our uh, like-minded partners. I agree. That's really exciting. I, you know, we, we when, again, when I was in the Pentagon, we were, we were really concerned about one of our issues was onshoring mm -hmm. semiconductor production. And so your teaming with, with TSM, TSMC has many, many exciting implications. I want, if I could, I want to shift gear. So you talked about the workforce, and I, I agree. That's obviously one of, one of the great contributions mm -hmm. from our from our universities. How do we how do we get our best students motivated to pursue careers that are relevant to national defense? Is do you, have you found a secret sauce? Well, I think we there? need to uh, work as a team to continue to explore a variety of uh, possibilities. One of which is to uh, engage our students early on and more frequently with this uh, very large and complex uh, industry sector uh, and engage with government agencies, uh, including uh, DOD, where you had the leadership uh, roles uh, over the past the number of years, and uh, awareness of the opportunities out there and becoming familiar with uh, the uh, faces and the procedures and the priorities 
uh, of the uh, national defense sector. And I would also imagine that it helps to get the faculty members to be more engaged, uh, and not only for uh, funding reasons, but uh, for a variety of conversations. I, mean, I remember this hypersonics uh, uh, capacity summit uh, back in uh, 2019, end of July, that uh, Purdue and NDIA together hosted here, and that involved a lot of professors, uh, both at Purdue and nearby great universities in Indiana and elsewhere. And we were able to make a lot of connections between professors and the industry leaders in the space. And then that led naturally to a lot of master students, PhD students at least, becoming engaged. Uh, and then finally, I would imagine internship positions, whether it's for the undergrad students or for grad students, would also be very uh, useful as a mechanism to introduce uh, these two parts of the world to each other. Uh, so that they have some direct experience of working together and then that, that can lead to a, a permanent employment discussion after the internship. I, I really resonate your point with your point about connecting faculty members. I, I used to tell in the government labs you know, to have folks brag about, oh, we brought these students in and we did interns. That's wonderful. That's great. But if you connect this as two student, that's one off. If you connect yes. with a faculty member, that gives you a pipeline, and you get you tie into their students, and and you build a relationship for many many years. So I I I, I, I think that that's a that's a wonderful point. Um, let me ask. You know, there's there are some universities that have been frankly, well, I'd say shy mm -hmm. about working with the Department of Defense. Um, they get concerned about restrictions on what the work mm -hmm. they can do and who can work on their projects. Um, it, 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 it seems that you at Purdue have managed to strike mm -hmm. just about the right balance, in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. You maintain academic freedom, but yet you also understand and respect the needs sometimes of, of, of you know, national defense research. Could, could you comment about that mm -hmm. and the processes that you follow? Yep. And so first of all, I'm lines? glad to uh, amplify a clear message sent from President Daniels and Purdue Board of Trustees just last Friday. Uh, right before the weekend, and uh, you can look up uh, in the news release and so on. Basically, President Daniels announced uh, a next phase of uh, Purdue's uh, uh, growth and uh, growth to prominence, and that is what we call the Purdue Moves 2.0. Uh, there was a Purdue Moves, I guess, 1.0 now uh, that started when uh, President Daniels became uh, the university president, and uh, now he launched. Uh, with the board, this set of uh, five pillars, including one precisely on national security and technology. And another one is on uh, the creation of uh, Purdue's Applied Research Institute uh, that will also be very much engaged. So two of the five pillars uh, are directly on the topics that we're looking at here. In this podcast with you, Mark, uh, it shows a uh, tremendous level of investment uh, and self-confidence and desire for partnership. Uh, we're going to build out the internal infrastructure. We're going to seek even broader and deeper partnership uh, in this space. We're going to continue to do our job in education and workforce, including online learning for those already in the workforce. And we're going to continue our research unique excellence in uh, several topics, which we may come back to a bit later. Uh, now, I think there is a clear a viable path to create the right kind of environment. Certain kind of activities would require procedures and clearance and protection, and others uh, will be more uh, open ecosystem oriented, and we can have both coexistent. Uh, Purdue is uh, uh, not uh, the only one uh, by any stretch of imagination. Uh, there are many other outstanding institutions that have been able to demonstrate how doable that is. Uh, but I think that uh, it's a clear uh, message that we are sending to say that uh, on the topics of national security, and defense, research, and workforce, uh, Purdue is here and ready and eager to work with our partners. Very good, very good. I, you know, that, that leads to another, another topic. And, and frankly, sometimes it's it's a sensitive issue, but it's the, the role of our universities in, mm -hmm. in attracting the best and the brightest from around the world to come and study and learn and, 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 and stay here. 
And and you know I I there's some I'm sure you've encountered this I I have there's some who would like to close the doors and and limit the number of foreign students who are studying in our universities, and 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 yet you know if we we see the numbers a significant fraction of our science technology workforce uh, is is foreign born, and 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 I wonder if if you could share some thoughts about that how do we continue to attract the best and the brightest how do we keep the welcome mat you know out out there so that 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 that, that, that the, the greatest minds from around the world will want to study in our universities. Yep. Uh, Mark, absolutely, we uh, should welcome uh, the best and brightest minds uh, with a proper procedure, and vetting is needed, uh, depending you know, on the specifics, uh, but to welcome uh, all of the best and brightest minds from around the world uh, to come to the United States. We hope that uh, they may also want to stay here after their study and a contribute to uh, the United States, and maybe they will one day become a citizen of this great country uh, and uh, continue uh, to stay here. So uh, I think there will be uh, clearly uh, certain sectors and areas where you've got to be more careful, uh, but I'm very optimistic that a proper balance can be maintained between the necessary care one must deploy uh, and the overall welcoming atmosphere and environment because uh, uh, we've got to run faster than everybody else. We've got to run faster than we have been running ever before. Uh, that's a tall order, but I'm confident that uh, you know this country can do that. And uh, the talent pipeline is arguably the most important supply chain in the world, uh, more than goods, more than uh, data, more than ideas, more than uh, money and financial assets, it is uh, the human talent supply chain. Uh, and we want to be that prime destination uh, whereby we can attract uh, them uh, to come to our country. Uh, so uh, the success we have had uh, in all sectors in society, uh, I think, have been attributable to the United States being such a uh, country with open-minded and open-armed approach when it comes to welcoming uh, people. Now, uh, I remember it was uh, perhaps President Reagan who said it. I'm sure others have said similar variants. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, you can learn Spanish, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, and go live in Spain and uh, uh, for many years and even become a citizen. Uh, uh, but it's not sure if everybody will view you as uh, a Spaniard. And uh, you can learn Japanese, be fluent, go live in Japan for the rest of your life, and so on. And not clear if everybody will think of you as a Japanese. Maybe they will these days. I don't know. This was a quote from the 80s. Uh, but America is such an uh, exceptional country uh, in human civilization that uh, you can be from anywhere in the world and come to the United States and uh, if you would like to, one day, you can become an American. Uh, this is such a powerful uh, part of what defines this great country. Uh, and I'm very confident that will continue. I, you know, I, 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 I profoundly agree with you. Um, uh, I, I, I have a I have a good friend who likes to explain that being American is it's like joining a club, <laughs> and and you know that that everyone is admitted if they want to. You just you know there 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 are, there are values that we share, there are there there are, there are attributes that you know that 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 we 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 we, uh, we, we cherish together, and that and then and and that that that's that's the price yeah. of admission. And I think that there will be a certain steps one has to take uh, to join. But it shouldn't be excessively hard, uh, it, and it shouldn't be uh, artificially uh, roadblocks uh, along the way. Uh, we respect uh, necessary due process. Uh, uh, but at the same time, as many leaders in the tech space, including uh, defense tech space, have also highlighted that it wouldn't be nice if we can get the best minds to come here and work here in the United States for the United States. Yes, I, I agree. You know, there, there are some of us who suggested that you know, every every foreign-born student who gets a PhD should get that PhD diploma with a green card <laughs> stapled to it. Well, yeah, that analogy has been um, made I, indeed yeah. by many prominent leaders. Uh, 
Now, depending on how you define stapling, you know, uh, and it, <laughs> yeah. you don't want to mess be, up the diploma. There may yeah. be, you know, a little bit uh, uh, process involved needed, uh, uh, but uh, it should be one where we uh, provide a welcoming, welcoming environment to talent. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm struck. Even um, last year, the National Science Board did their their Health of uh, Science and Engineering Enterprise report, and they they, they uh, you know looked looked at students coming from overseas. Uh, the number one country is mainland China. Uh, number two is India. And number three is South Korea. What struck me is I think more than 85 percent of the students from mainland China say they want to stay in the United States when they're done studying here. And and I, I'm sure some of them not for the best reasons, but but the overwhelming majority. One, they, they, they embrace the, the, the freedoms and, and the spirit of innovation in our country. And that, to me, is one of the, one of the greatest hopes that we have. Um, I, that kind of leads into, uh, you know, Meng, you spent, you spent a year with the State Department and, and sitting at the right hand of the Secretary of State advising him on, on all manner of issues related to science and technology. Um, I, I often would, would say that among, among our great strengths is the close connections we've got, our allies and our partners. Um, you know, we, we, we worry about competition with China, but I would submit that they don't have those close connections. We do. We, we, have, we have relationships that are built by shared values and, and, and common goals and common interests. Um, um, could, could you comment about, about your, your sense of that, uh, about, about how, how we work best with partners and allies, how, how we keep those connections going and, and what it yep. means for I think we have a lot of like-minded partners to the United States. Uh, and uh, as you said, we share a lot in our value system, uh, and uh, we have a lot of uh, common topics that we can work on together. You know, semiconductor is one example, uh, and you can look at communication technologies, AI, data sharing, quantum, and so on. Right? Uh, we have the opportunity of student talent exchange. Speaking of a welcoming. Uh, visitors as well as uh, those who would like to stay here uh, after they graduate. You know, we have a lot of, uh, I think, still uh, under-tapped opportunities to encourage more of those talent pipeline building uh, between the United States and a lot of our like-minded partners. Uh, we have, I think, the opportunities to compare notes uh, and work on R&D together. You know, there have been a lot of prime examples of success uh, in front of us uh, between the U.S., for example, and collaboration with, say, like Sweden, Finland uh, in certain research areas that have been very beneficial uh, to all the countries involved. Uh, so I'm absolutely uh, strongly at, uh, in favor of creating even more conduits and mechanisms uh, whereby you can have this multilateral uh, or bilateral relationships uh, that uh, goes deep into uh, technology, education, uh, and R&D collaboration. I, yeah, I, I couldn't, couldn't agree more, Abs absolutely. So, so Mang, I, I want to ask you, you know, as, yes. as, as a fellow academic, as you know, I, I spent most of my, my life on a university campus. And I always felt when, whenever I was, I was worried about the future, I'd just look yes. at the students around me. I'd, I'd see the bright faces and bright minds in the class and realize there's nothing to worry about. These students are brighter than we ever were. They're more capable than we ever were. They have so many tools at, at, their, finger, at their fingertips. Um, it's always invigorating. And yet, you know, you've also had a, a you know, national leadership position. So let me ask, what, what keeps you up at night? What do you, what do you worry about the most? And, 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 and are, are, you, are you optimistic about, about – the United States' position in, 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 yep. in, in well, national defense uh, technology? Well, first of all, I sleep very well, so um, uh, I'm not sure if I will be able to uh, you know, answer your um, direct question, but I get what you mean, Mark. And uh, I think we got to keep thinking about investing in our uh, future R&D uh, capabilities, uh, investing in all the way from K-12 uh, here in the U.S. in STEM-related fields the strength of our K-12 schools uh, and uh, welcoming uh, the uh, talents uh, from uh, many different places around the world uh, to come here. Uh, and I think of, as you said, the future is in the hands of uh, 
uh, who, those who are currently students and uh, uh, how do we give them the best education. There's uh, a lot that a university can do there. And how do we uh, make sure that once they are in the workforce, they will continue to be able to reinvent themselves. Because at the end of the day, it is a knowledge economy. It is about uh, the uh, strength of the talent pool. And uh, uh, the graduation from college at age 22 or from a graduate program later uh, should never be viewed as the end of one's learning curve. And in uh, areas such as national uh, security and defense technologies, uh, things move so fast. And we ought to make sure that uh, they continue to learn. You know, online learning, uh, which Purdue uh, has made a great uh, strides in recent years, uh, has a clear role to play there. Uh, and you know, if I look at the research strength, as alluded to just now, uh, at Purdue, uh, especially in College of Engineering, but also throughout the university, in areas such as hypersonics, which I know uh, you know a lot about, uh, in semiconductors, right, in uh, cybersecurity and 5G, in uh, advanced manufacturing, additive manufacturing and digital twin, and so on, uh, and in uh, uh, space technologies, and generally speaking, uh, uh, aero uh, or astronautics uh, solutions. Uh, there's a lot of strength here, and there are some also unique areas such as energetic material and systems uh, that Purdue is uh, uniquely strong uh, in the country. Uh, <clears throat> we see often the most important dimension is to make sure that we have the new professors coming online. Uh, that uh, we have the postdocs, the grad students, and even the undergrad students uh, who can uh, participate and contribute and lead. So I think it comes down to this, the who before the what, and to make sure we have the greatest uh, talent pipeline. Uh, and those particular research areas at Purdue is just tip of an iceberg. Uh, but in every part of this uh, growing, vibrant iceberg, uh, I think uh, we'll all appreciate uh, the availability of the highest quality uh, talent. Right, and you know, your, your, those topic areas that you mentioned, that's very well aligned to the National Defense Strategy Emerging Technologies. So you know, we're focusing on an NDIA, but it's, you know, the Department of Defense is very much focused on it. It's, it's, it's very reassuring to see that, you know, that, th that list of priorities has, has, uh, has infused itself in, in, in your research agenda as well. So, so Meng, as 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 we wrap up, um, you know, you've been you've been leading the College of Engineering now at, at a very difficult time. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Hopefully, we're seeing a light at the end of the tunnel as vaccinations are, are ramping up. I I even had my first vaccination, um, and 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 but yet I, I'm sure there are some lessons learned. You mentioned online online education. Um, how do you think the pandemic will change the way the way we deliver instruction in in the years to come? Mm -hmm. Yep, um, I think uh, people will want to make sure that uh, they are not what some would call uh, paying $50,000 a year or, or any uh, substantial amount of money for a uh, video streaming service. Right. Uh, I'm a big fan of online learning, and I think online learning to be effective uh, involves technologies and uh, pedagogy that is way deeper and broader than just streaming the video. That's just the start people will be asking uh, the question, what is the unique value add by a residential learning experience? Uh, and uh, we got to, as a university, provide the best and strongest answer as to why it uh, is particularly impactful to uh, learn and to live on a residential campus. Uh, so I think these two as uh, a reinforcing and complementary uh, pair of topics. One is how do we make online learning truly effective? How do we even know that they are learning? Uh, but at the same time, while we advance the technology and pedagogy of online learning to make it effective at scale, we also uh, dramatically enhance the value we create for the students and the parents and society at large uh, and our corporate partners uh, on residential learning. That they got to be the unique things that only residential learning can provide. For example, not 
just about what you cover in classrooms, but also what you uncover in classrooms and outside, and uh, what you can do during these few years you're on campus to explore yourself as a person and explore society uh, with uh, the largest degrees of freedom and uh, the most uh, exciting set of potential. Uh, so it goes way beyond taking courses, although that's important to value, uh, we have to reinforce. But there is a total package, and all universities, uh, and Purdue, for example, uh, another part of the Purdue Moves 2.0 announced last Friday, is the strategic initiative when it comes to innovating learning and teaching in a res residential environment. So I'm very hopeful that soon we'll see an even more effective online learning and out of a healthy competitive spirit and even a more <laughs> worthwhile residential learning. Very good. Dean, Dean Meng Chang, thank, thank you so much for joining me on this podcast. I've so enjoyed this conversation. I feel like we could go on for another another <laughs> couple of hours, but 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 again, I really appreciate it. I will I will say that um, having a leader such as yourself at the head of one of our great colleges of engineering uh, gives me a lot of optimism for the future. So thanks for everything that you do. Well, again, thank, thank you, you for Mark. Us. Uh, it's, it's a fabulous team of what we call boilermakers here uh, yeah. at Purdue. Uh, and I'm just uh, very blessed to be a part of this team. And congratulations again, Mark, uh, on your leadership uh, within NDIA at this moment. Uh, in addition to all the wonderful things you've done serving the country and also leading another great uh, set of academic institutions. I know that uh, we can all learn a lot from your Emergence Technology Institute. Great. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Great to be here.